Today is July 25th, 2019, and we're speaking with Christine Zuni Cruz from Isleta Pueblo, located just south of Albuquerque. We are joined by our videographer, Dr. Beverly Singer, and our project assistants, Jonna Payton and Valerie Fernando. The interview is being conducted by Rose Diaz, IPCC Research Coordinator. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome. We're uh, happy to hear your story and of course about the many adventures and experiences in the law. I'd like to begin by introducing you to our audience. Sure. Christine Zuni Cruz is the daughter of Jose Abelicio Zuni from Isleta and Christine Cata Zuni, known as Povi, from Okeowinge. Her father was an administrator for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the family lived in Colorado, Nevada, Alaska, and Washington, D.C. Her mother was a potter and known for her horned vases, carved pottery, and storytellers. She exhibited in the Santa Fe Indian Market and also provided demonstrations at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. The couple raised a family of six children. Christine attended Isleta Day School, Ignacio Elementary in Colorado, and Fremont Elementary, Carson Junior High, and High School in Carson City, Nevada. She attended Stanford University and Antioch School of Law in Washington, D.C., graduating from the University of New Mexico School of Law in 1982. She subsequently joined its faculty in 1992. She also has held various professorships, including UNM Director of the Southwest Indian Law Clinic and the University of Saskatchewan College of Law. Zuni Cruz is the first Pueblo woman to earn tenure as a law professor. She has extensive experience in various judgeships with the Pueblo of Isleta, Santa Clara, Taos, and Laguna. In her experience, she lists a variety of task forces, commissions, consultancies, as well as private practice. Her awards and honors go back to 1995 and include the Derek Bell Award, the Law Foundation of Saskatchewan, William Pincus Award from the American Law School, the New Mexico Commission on the Status of Women, and the Stanford American Indian Alumni Association's Award for Public Service to Indian Country. She is a U.S. State Department speaker and specialist in Bolivia and Brazil, and her research and teaching have taken her also to Greenland, Ecuador, Libya, Mexico, Australia, and the South Pacific. She lives in Albuquerque with her spouse, Robert, and they have two children, Emmanuel Cruz Zuni and Fabiz Zuni Cruz. She currently holds a professorship at the University of New Mexico School of Law. I hope I got that. Most of it right. <laughs> Mostly, just a few things. Okay, we can change those. Thank you again for joining with us and participating in this project. There's just so much to your life experiences, but we need to start somewhere. So where we will start with you um, to ask you about your young life. Mm -hmm. Your parents, you, you know, you traveled around a lot, it seemed, in your early life. Your siblings, grandparents, community. How did that, all of that impact you as a young child? Yes, I did uh, begin school at Isleta Pueblo. We lived there. My father worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs as an administrator. And then he was uh, transferred to um, Ignacio, Colorado, the Ute Mountain Ute Agency there, and then from there to uh, Stewart, Nevada. He uh, was a superintendent at, at Stewart. And then from there, I then went to California at um, Palo Alto, where Stanford University was located, and then I came home to Isleta. So that was kind of my my full circle in terms of places that I lived. And my father was um, stationed or assigned to different places, mm -hmm. including in Alaska and Washington, D.C. I, I grew up um, in a large family, I think large not for that time, and that there were seven of us, actually. We lost my younger brother um, a few uh, years back. Now there are six of us uh, um, living. My father and my mother were significant um, in, I think, everything that I did throughout my life. I think my father, um, who had a, a BA, 
um, from UNM. He he was an example to to me at least in terms of you know this idea that you could go on to school. School went beyond college, and of course my siblings. Um, were the same. My older siblings, I'm the youngest daughter in the family of seven, and then I had my younger brother after me who, who we lost. It was both my parents and my siblings who sort of provided this example of, you know, um, higher education, that it was something that you did after high school, and that as I saw them go off to college, you know, it, it was something that I knew that um, was possible. So that was significant. Um, my father, you know, there were it wasn't a lot of explicit uh, expectation, but I think that that there was a unstated sort of like expectation of what um, was expected of of us in terms of um, higher education, education generally. He was very mindful of our grades and, you know, how we were doing in school. So I think that that was really an influence on me. And, and my older sister, I think, was probably the greatest influence in, in my family. You know, she's a couple years older than me. And um, she set the standard and sort of blazed the trail um, for high school and that was a very good thing to have somebody that you were very close to and you could relate to um, but also who could um, show you you know the way and that things could be done and so she was a very good older sister uh, role model for me and I literally followed her everywhere when we were little and then she went to Stanford before I did and so I followed her a couple of years later and at that time where there were, you know, not a lot of Native people going to, um, to college, it was a good thing to have her there um, to, to help me and to guide me. And her name? Evelina Zuni Lucero. <laughs> okay. Um, she's uh, married at Isleta and so lives a few, uh, just a little ways down from me, and so we're still... Mm -hmm. Close. How did you combine community events and family life? What kinds of things were important to the family? My father was transferred to Ignacio, um, and I believe that I was in first grade at that point. And so um, I remember a lot of trips back home from Ignacio. I remember, you know, as we would come that drive and coming over the hill um, into Albuquerque, and then down to Isleta, where we visited my grandmother um, quite a bit, as we were so close. And then um, when he got transferred to Nevada, it was a little bit further, but we also you know, made trips home. And that was very important in terms of keeping that connection to the community, um, to um, the Pueblo, and our relatives, my grandmother, and my aunts, and my cousins. It was significant because after having been away, um, being, you know, at these different agencies, Ignacio and then um, Stewart, where, you know, I really was um, exposed to a lot of different tribal peoples, people from, who worked for the agency from, you know, a lot of different tribes throughout the nation and then also from um, you know, Colorado or from the Nevada, the Carson City or the Ignacio area, the Southern Ute and the Ute in Colorado and that it was really the Paiute and the Washoe Shoshone people and then um, all the other tribes that, that were going to school at the agencies at that time. It was a great exposure to the diversity of indigenous peoples, you know, the multiple backgrounds. I had friends from um, all different tribes. I got that exposure, but by the time I was at Stanford, where, I was, where there was also a good cohort of Native students, different tribes, different backgrounds, that group had this, um, it was like a joint um, uh, goal of, you know, taking that education and returning home. The greatest thing that you could do with your education was to go home to you know work with your tribe or work for your your tribe and so that i i believe was like 
it was it was explicitly stated that we had that value as a cohort, and so um, uh, you know immediately after four years at Stanford, you know I returned to Isleta um, following my sister who had done some work and then um, was living in the village, and so uh, we, we returned. When your uh, sister returned, what did she major in in college? Uh, my sister was in communication hmm. in, at, at Stanford, and um, she actually became an author. And, um, she uh, wrote a book. She's uh, taught at IAIA. In a lot of ways, we were you know, really very much doing similar things. She just retired in the spring um, after several years at the Institute, hmm. um, where she taught creative writing. Native lit. She went into communication, and specifically, I think, in journalism. And then I also was a, a communication major, and I was really interested in this um, document, uh, documentaries, um, filmmaking. But when I returned from from Stanford um, to Albuquerque, I really didn't see any open opportunities for that kind of work at that time. I always tell my students at the law school that I returned a decade too, too soon because it was like maybe maybe a decade, two decades later, you know, that there was this introduction of a lot of this film industry into New Mexico. You know, I was thinking of Santa Fe, but I really, after having been gone for so long, um, that I wanted to remain in my home, and, 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 you know, at Isleta. I then began looking at other avenues of work, and um, that's kind of how law kind of presented itself. I didn't intend, while I was a student at the university level, that law would be my field of work. It was something that I knew about. There were, you know, we had some Indian law courses, some, some lawyers from the Bay Area would come in and teach um, Indian law. And so certainly there were, you know, there, it was there as a possibility, as a, as a potential um, field, but I really felt like I needed to find out more about um, the legal profession. I needed to see um, people doing what I thought I wanted to do, to make sure I could do that through that legal field before I made the commitment to to law, and so that was the time that I spent at Antioch, Antioch School of Law in Washington D.C., where um, nationwide there was a program to prepare uh, paralegals for uh, legal assistance in Indian country, because there weren't very many Indian lawyers in Indian country. The idea was that you would prepare paraprofessionals or paralegals to assist. The, the attorneys who were in Indian country to, you know, work um, within communities and with the tribal peoples. And so I was a part of that program, and then that's where I, I became a part of that program to really um, determine whether law was for me, me, was a field that I wanted to pursue, because law school was, um, you know, a commitment. It was a professional school commitment of three years. Um, you had to take a test the law school admissions test for admissions and then you know, determine what school you were going to go to and you know I really wanted to determine whether or not it could fit given that my initial intention was you know to do something completely different from law to do you know documentary or film you know make films that sort of thing so it was really a, a very good, it was a one, two-year program designed for Native people throughout Indian country. And uh, it was my exposure at Antioch to the group of law students there who were very social justice minded, who, you know, just sort of exemplified the type of lawyering that I could see myself doing and that I wanted to do. That's where I met my husband. Um, Robert Cruz at, at Antioch School of Law, and he was one of those students. But there was just something about the students who were very grounded in um, 
who they were as indigenous peoples, very activist oriented and you know, connecting that with law and through law seek social change and transformation. And so um, it was really that cohort of students I met at Antioch, Antioch who helped me to see that law was really a vehicle um, to do what I wanted to do. Um, and that inspired me, inspired me to, um, to make that decision that I could go to law school and that um, I could do what I was interested in um, by attending um, law school and, and you know, obtaining the Juris Doctorate. So you decided to come back to UNM to do that work? So the, the program at Antioch was one where um, they gave us training and we trained in different parts of Indian country including at, in Washington DC and then we were sent back to our communities to begin doing some work. Antioch was a very clinical, had a clinical approach to law teaching so it was very unique in terms of law schools throughout the country. Um, so I came back and worked with Legal Aid in Albuquerque for a year, and it was during that time that I made my decision to uh, apply to UNM and was accepted at the law school in UNM, which had a very good reputation for um, preparing students in the area of um, Indian law for enrolling Native students. And so I had learned from my experience at Stanford that that cohort, you know, the, the number of students um, that you could um, interact with and, and have a support unit for that. That was really very critical. That was certainly something that drew me to UNM, but I think most importantly, UNM was a drive, a 20 minute drive from my home at Isleta. I was really very blessed to be able to, you know, stay at home um, at Isleta and go to school in Albuquerque. Um, and I didn't have to move, um, and, and, was, and at the same time was at a very, probably the leading school in the nation at that time for uh, preparation in federal Indian laws and admission of law student, native law students, so it, it worked out well. I'm going to go back a little bit um, to your memories, early childhood memories of uh, living in Isleta and wondering if there was one event that uh, sticks out in your mind that you know, was very either formative or funny or uh, somehow impacted you or probably drove you away from home, but <laughs> some, a story that you could relate to us about that? Yes, I, I don't think so much as driving me away <laughs> from home, but probably grounded me in that, mm -hmm. that idea of um, home and, um, and belonging. But I can remember um, my sister and I walking from our home to the little store across the plaza. And, you know, it was, it was dusty and hot, um, but we would walk to the store, uh, you know, to, to get what, whatever treat or, you know, whatever we were sent to by my mom to, to go in and buy. So as we would walk through the plaza, there would be people there. It was just before 1960. So, you know, like tourists would come in they would ask us, can we take your picture? Can we take a picture of you? My sister was older, and so you know, she would always respond. And so she, I remember distinctly one time where she said yes, and so um, we stood there and they took our picture, and um, then they gave us a dime, or they gave us, you know, a, a dime or a nickel, I don't remember what, but they gave us some money, and so we were so, you know, happy because then we could go to the store and get some penny candy. The idea of walking, you know, walking through from the house, um, through the plaza to that to that little store to buy pop or bread or whatever, you know, my, my mom um, would send us or my older sisters would send us off to buy and walking there um, with my sister and sort of like, you know, at the time I didn't know it, but really being the other and, you know, being photographed and then paid for for that but the just the happiness of having you know this extra money to buy candy or you know whatever it was that that um, that we could afford with that that reminds me both of the closeness with my sister um, but also the very physical part of you know walking um, 
in the Pueblo, in the, in the sandy, you know, um, uh, road, you know, from the home of, through the plaza to the, to the store. And knowing everybody, knowing mm -hmm. everybody that you came across. Right, yeah. yeah, that it was, it was in fact, um, that's really interesting because I remember moving from Isleta to Ignacio and they're sort of like later reflecting on how that was really like from a very contained world to one that was almost, you know, like, you know, like much, much more wider where I didn't know everybody. I didn't know, you know, it in the same way that I knew, knew the village. It was just a, such a huge difference moving from the village to um, Ignacio, which is, and, and still is, a very small little, little town, little sleepy town. Um, so, you know, it was, and, and that was a huge, huge transition for me, you know, significant just in terms of the difference. You know, you go from a you know, community that is contained to, to a much broader community where there are different families and, you know, you're not related or, you know, you don't, mm -hmm. you're not connected in the same way. The other people within the community that are different from you as well. So how did you get involved with uh, so many countries on a global scale as a legal consultant? My um, interest in international, first of all, travel, and then work came really from two places. First, at Stanford, they had these overseas programs. And so I was able to complete a semester in the overseas program um, in England. We were outside of London um, in the old Astor estate that the university had somehow acquired. I, I, I understand now that program has moved to Oxford, but it was like this very privileged space. I don't know how, I don't know what the connection was that Stanford had it, but that's where we went to school for the summer. And just that experience of you know, traveling, going very far, being in a whole different nation setting was really important to, to me in terms of opening my eyes about what the United States looked like from a different perspective from another country. How important it was to have that view from outside the U.S., you know, and looking back. And um, so then that was really my introduction to international travel and it was it was important because I think if I hadn't done that I don't think that I would have been as drawn to traveling internationally as I was it was just that experience that I could do it that I liked it that it was interesting that there is some sacrifice in international travel and that you're not at home and the length of time you know can sometimes be a factor as well I think I was gone for a, a summer with that initial open door, then when I was offered, given the chance to travel to the South Pacific, I was like, definitely. I think there were five or six of us, Indian lawyers, judges, uh, people involved in the justice system. And we went out to the South Pacific to look at their indigenous um, systems, starting in um, Papua New Guinea, and then we went to Vanuatu and um, Solomon Islands and Fiji and then I, I think back to Papua New Guinea that that was um, sort of like my my first introduction to traveling specifically to meet with and interact with indigenous peoples and so that really was then the the, the gateway to all of the travel and the interest that I then had because you see how much in common you have and really get a idea of indigenous peoples as having this internationality, this, this aspect that it's, it's um, broader than, you know, certainly, you know, certainly from where you're at across the state and then across the nation, that it's even broader to these places that are very foreign, at least in terms of, you know, your experience. They are indigenous and that there's a connection to them that really comes from 
um, from your knowledge systems that they're very similar and how important it is to connect with them to find out what they're doing and for them to hear you know what's happening in the United States um, with indigenous peoples um, sort of like it just opens you know eyes on both sides it opens in heart, hearts as well in terms of the connections that, that you make that are really you know they last for a long time after that initial trip is when I began traveling more frequently for more legal exchanges around indigenous law primarily but you know more broadly just um, Indian law so to have gone to Australia and then to Bolivia and Ecuador to have met the uh, met and you know become friends with indigenous people that you know you only see in pictures or you know only hear about like in Bolivia just very striking to um, to be delivering a few words some remarks to this huge number of of native people and then to in the streets to see you know native people everywhere particularly in Bolivia you know all you know still uh, wearing their native dress very impressive I mean you know just these these impressions that you get that stick with you for life but at the same time being able to see that there's a lot of similarity you know um, the relationship with the nation state, the discrimination, which is similar to, to what we see here, you know, maybe maybe here, um, you know, our society generally is, you know, a little bit different from, say, in, in Bolivia, but still, there are these threads that are, that are the same, where the language is the same, there's much more connection, so like in, the, like in Australia, and New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, where they speak English, Solomon Islands, Fiji, Vanuatu, you know, where their the colonization and the um, the education was was through the English. When you have to go through a second language like Spanish, you know, it's a little bit harder. But it's also really important for Indigenous peoples to be multilingual. You know, their Indigenous language absolutely for the United States English, but also in other languages, because then you can engage with mm -hmm. indigenous peoples outside the world, and that direct communication is always the most critical and the most important, because you can exchange and engage with one another in that, in that, even if it's, a, it's not your own language, it's that dominant language that you're both familiar with. I was curious about your work with um, indigenous legal systems as compared to a Western legal system, and what do you find is the core um, disagreement, or where the court, you know, disagreement could come together? That really is what my work in the legal field or centers on. My scholarship and my teaching is in the indigenous legal tradition, and the difference really is in legal traditions and so we have legal traditions throughout the world um, in the united states american common law system really is a combination of the common law and the civil law system but we call it the american common law system it comes from two legal traditions the civil legal tradition and the common law legal tradition whereas the indigenous people come from a specific legal tradition which comparative legal scholars call the Chthonic legal tradition. But from the Chthonic legal tradition, all these other legal traditions we see throughout the world, and there are seven, so you could say six other major legal traditions really moved away from or moved um, out of this Chthonic legal tradition. And so the difference is there within the core of the legal, legal tradition, so that the legal traditions are different. For indigenous peoples, their legal tradition really is a part of a larger indigenous knowledge framework um, where law really is not thought of in the same way at all that it is thought of in the common law or the civil law legal tradition. 
So first of all, it's just this huge difference in legal traditions. The indigenous knowledge frame really does not separate out distinct areas like like in our college, if you just think of the college where you go and you can study art, you can study um, law, you can study psychology or sociology or whatever area. There are distinct branches and you know distinct schools and they're all separated from one another. Whereas the indigenous knowledge system really has no, it's not like that. Everything is combined. So that if you're thinking about law within that framework within that knowledge framework it's not going to be a separate distinct branch like it is over here and so law is really intertwined in everything else in philosophy in art in um, relationships in politics you know how the political structure is is set up um, it's embedded in the language um, in the land so you know just a very different way of thinking about law um, and, and how law operates in relationship to all these other disciplines. First of all, they're just two different legal traditions, fundamentally. And then beyond that, you know, you, you go into describing, you know, the type of knowledge frame that this concept or this idea of in, indigenous law, and that's sort of like, you know, I would put quotes around that, comes out of that indigenous knowledge frame, and it's much different. It's fuller. It's intertwined with all of these other disciplines. The Australians say is that their law touches the ground, which it, it, to me means that it's very much centered or grounded in the land. They see the, I guess it would be the Australian common law system as being this far off the ground, that it doesn't quite make that connection to the land. It's a very profound but you know simple way of expressing that land is a central part of the law and of our identity and so therefore a central part of how you know you would think about think about law the land that you're from informs the law as well as your way of being on that land and that's all a part of that indigenous knowledge frame and thinking about Indigenous law. I know that in uh, 2011, uh, Dean Washburn of the UNM School of Law stated that, quote, you were a national legal expert in clinical law education and a brilliant entrepreneur in legal academics, particularly in launching the law journal and the Indian Law Clinic, which drove you to establish each um, I don't know if they came together or they came separately. So let's start with the legal Clinic. Yeah, that's actually, that was my entree into the Legal Academy. Um, I was hired to direct and develop the Southwest Indian Law Clinic. Um, and UNM was actually a, is actually a leader in terms of clinical legal education, which is really for the type of education where you take the students and you um, give them a case and help them attend to that case, much like in medicine where the methodology of education is they began administering medicine to um, patients under the direction of a, of a doctor. The same, it's the same concept in law. The law school was beginning this program in clinical legal education, specifically in Indian law, um, the representation of native clients, the use of Indian law in um, training students. Um, about the practice of law. I was a founding director of the Southwest Indian Law Clinic uh, where we began training students at UNM um, in, through this clinical methodology in Indian law practice. It was an opportunity for, for me to take uh, sort of like my, my training um, both at, at Antioch, um, my experience of working um, in practice or after graduation, um, but this idea of community lawyering, where when you're representing an individual or working with individuals, that um, for Native peoples, you really have to consider them um, in, a, in a broader sense, that they are individuals, yes, but they are individuals that come from 
a community and that you have to keep that in mind as you're practicing law. You know, how do they sit within that community? How does their legal um, problems sit within the community and, uh, you know, may be affected by that and or affect the client's um, um, situation as well as protecting Native people generally just in terms of their treatment in outside of the tribal setting, state systems and federal systems. It's a very mindful way of thinking of Native peoples um, as tribal peoples on the practice of law, the way that we practice law. Have you seen an upsurge in Native students coming to this field with uh, having the law clinic? I think that the law clinic um, has always been a draw um, because not all law schools have a clinical law component. And there are other schools that run clinics where um, you, um, you know, only a certain percentage of the student body will take part in the clinics or, you know, they have to lottery into the clinics. And at UNM it's required for all of the, our students to have this, which really is intended to make them more practice ready. But I think importantly, um, students learn um, as they actually practice in a different way than you learn when it's just, you know, theoretical or you're learning about cases and how the judges decided certain cases. So, so I do think that we do see students at UNM who um, see this as something that they want as part of their education and I think it's a, a very important part. Um, the fact that we have a program that allows those who are interested in Indian law to actually do that practice you know, specifically in that field is a, is a great opportunity for those who are interested in you know, a future in the field of Indian law. Because most of our graduate, graduates from UNM really remain here and practice here. And so for the law school, which you know, ran a program for, I guess it must have been maybe 20 years before they added the Indian uh -huh. law component. Um, but it, it's an important piece. It's an important piece. And that's really what I was talking about in terms of Antioch, that their whole school from first year to third year is they immerse their students in clinical law. You're engaging with clients from the first point. And so like that program that they ran, um, they said, we're not going to just teach you. You've got to go. <laughs> you got to figure out how you're going to be working in this area. What has touched you the most in your work that has led you to further your commitment to a real justice system for indigenous people? What has touched me the most? I think what drew me to the academy and of course, you know, this ability to teach in a clinic where I could teach but also practice. And so, you know, that they, they're very, they, they work off one another. They're, so that, that just that idea is very important. You know, as an academician, you have to write. You have to um, produce, you know, um, scholarship. And so I think that that ability to reflect about what I was seeing, you know, what I had seen in law, in justice systems, how it was impacting communities. That was very significant. And so I'd say like there are a lot of different things that have been significant. Um, being able to really understand the impact of law, the impact of different policies connected to the law, and what their results have been on indigenous people has been profound. Like the individual clients and then what they go through um, and then why, you know, why they are where they're at and how that's related to, you know, all of these laws, which is like sort of the deeper picture. Um, and just having that ability to reflect and think about them. Early on, it was really seeing the impact of law on young men, you know, knowing the statistics um, about imprisonment and incarceration, seeing it play out in, in the client 
client pools that we saw. And so really thinking about the criminal justice system that can begin impacting young lives at, you know, um, a very young age, you know, at the time when they're in their form formative years, and then how once you get engaged in that system that that can mean uh, that you can be involved in that system for the rest of your life. What impact that then has on the family and the community. So having clients, young male clients, who were involved either with the tribal justice system or the state justice system, seeing it um, both from the client perspective and people within the community, within your own sphere, going through that, making all of these connections between why the laws were written as they are, how the systems operate and why they operate like that and how it all comes to to play in one person's life. I think it was my representation of a young Pueblo man and actually he was, you know, um, just at a, reaching adulthood. I, I mean adulthood as defined by um, U.S. laws 18 and really I think it's a much larger span. Adulthood is really when you, you know, really have your full um, sort of like cognitive abilities about you and a maturity that, you know, maybe is or is not 18 for, for everybody. Just seeing how, you know, from his life background to his, his life story to what was happening um, with him at that moment in time in the tribal and the federal system and then being able to interact with him one-on-one -on -one in terms of how it was um, affecting his thinking and his future. So that, I, I would say that that was one of the one of the clients that uh, was really very significant in, in my work um, at the clinic and, and then just being able to connect that not only to family but to community as well in terms of what we face, what our, what our young men face. You know, working with families and in family law, um, everything's connected. You might think of law as this, you know, very significant field or very significant uh, player, but in reality, everything is connected, and law is only a small strand of what comes into play in the lives of our of our people, both both for good and you know for um, you know for for not so good outcomes. Does this sort of tie into your judgeships? And, you know, making that change from uh, protecting someone as a defense person and then being the judge, how does that, how do you make that jump? My judging at the tribal level on the tribal bench, I think, was really very helpful just in terms of understanding the community and how the community is affected by law. And I would say that as a result of experience of sitting on the bench and having to deal with the law and people, how it affected the people before you, um, really was a big factor in my work in setting up the clinic and thinking about representing clients sort of from this community lawyering perspective where you think of the client not as an individual solely but as an individual who is connected um, to a larger community you know beginning from the very close which is family relatives um, close relatives to the larger community sitting on the bench allowed me to see the community in a, in a different way. I would say that when I sat on the bench, one of the probably most important things that impacted me was going to a, a training on, I think it was titled Understanding the, the Indian Community. But it was really about historical trauma, generational trauma, understanding the law from this lens of um, history 
that it was as a result of all these historical impacts of, of the law on Native peoples. That's how we get to the individual who is experiencing issues and that you may see before the court. So it's like this holistic um, understanding of the individual before you standing in the court as it was related to historical traumas that indigenous peoples have faced. And so how that impacts any given community, why, why we were seeing what we were seeing in the courtroom why we were seeing um, dysfunction in whichever way was um, manifesting. Dysfunction can manifest in one way or it can manifest across different indicators. But in the court, that's what you, you're really dealing with cases of trouble, people who get into trouble, you're dealing with those sorts of things. And when you do that day after day after day, it's really helpful to have this ability to think about it from further afield, like to think about how is it that you know, I keep seeing the same people or the same sorts of things, the alcohol usage, the family issues, the truancies or, you know, whatever. You know, why is that? And so in this understanding the Indian community, our trainer who, I think she had a, a her degree in um, psychology. And she was from Canada. Really, you know, put it in, in the form of historical trauma and the loss of land and all of just sort of like this timeline of events and how they have impacted the Native community, you know, that lead to the horizontal violence um, as a result of the oppression that really is coming from outside. And so really just a holistic way of looking that I never looked at what I was doing in the court or at individuals who get involved in the court system, or even the everyday just issues between two people in a community in the same way, because it's much more complex, and it's much more related to everything in our history, in the laws that have come into existence in terms of how we're supposed to address these issues or that affect us within our community as well as outside. Now, I think that that was really a profound shift for me on the bench as a trial judge. My hat is off to all of the people who work at the tribal, in the tribal bench because it's a lot of work. Um, it takes a lot to you know, be a trial bench judge over a career. But I shifted from the, the bench to the appellate level. In the appellate level, you're not like in the heat of it, sort of, with the, with the disputes before you. You've got an appeal and you've got a little bit more distance and time to think about you know, this issue. And I really think that there's, there's value in being able to think through you know, an issue, think about it, talk it over. So I was on a bench at Isleta with uh, we, we began with six or seven other justices, and then um, by the time that I left the bench, there were four or five. But that process of being able to think through what is the solution with, you know, more than yourself is a very good practice. And I think, you know, really that's, it's an important ability to be able to make decisions like that in a group. One of the things that interests me is your prolific writing, both in manuscript and article form. And there seems to be an urgency in those writings about disseminating this information. What drives you in that process? Something that I didn't mention about my decision to get into law was really connected to voice. Thinking about law or making this decision about what do, what am I going to do in, for the rest of my life in terms of a career? One of the things that I thought about was was voice that that I felt like I had something to say, or that I wanted to say, or I needed to say things, but that without the vehicle or the platform to say those things, I would just be a voice not listened to. Actually, I looked around and I thought, well, who, who's listened to? Who's listened to in my community or in the larger Indian 
country wide view. And I thought, well, lawyers, it's almost like everybody, you know, will pay some attention to what the lawyer is saying. And so I thought, they have a platform for their voice. I was a woman. Um, I, you know, more specifically a Pueblo woman. And I thought, you know, I don't think that people are going to listen to me as much without a JD or even a, a license as they will with a JD. And so I looked at it as a place for voice, to give voice to, you know, these feelings inside of me, these, these urgencies to speak about certain things, as, as you say. That was a reason why I decided to become a, a lawyer. I think just generally my voice is soft, but I realize that as a lawyer, whether your voice was loud or soft, it can be heard through many avenues. And so getting into the academy, I talked about it a little bit, you know, you, you uh, part of my draw to the academy was really this ability to have this time to think and to write about what you see and what you feel or what you think is important in the area of law. Well, that was a big draw to me as to um, entering the academy, becoming a clinician, but also there was a scholarship aspect to it. I knew that I was going to have to write and that to me, that appealed to me above everything else, was having this ability to, you know, give voice to what I was seeing and feeling needed to be said, um, or wasn't being said. And so that's really what drives my writing. But I think that finding your voice, finding, your, finding my voice in writing um, was a challenge. When I found my voice, it just comes from within, you know, that see these things and you need to, you need to say them. One of our final questions is, how do you define your role as a Pueblo woman representative of your community? I see, so there's like a, a public or a professional, right? And then there's the, the personal. And for me, they overlap and, you know, they twist in and out of one another all the time. In the public realm, I think that as a lawyer, as um, a mother, as somebody who has this experience that I've had, which is, you know, like being at home and then out and then back, that provides me with a, a different sort of view that has affected me and my work. I think that from going out from my community at such a young age, but then returning right after I graduated from, from school, it made me realize how important community and place is. I want to express that to others, um, to help them understand um, from, from not only a Pueblo viewpoint, but you know the wider indigenous viewpoint how important land is to identity to um to feelings of security you know at a very human level and to represent an understanding of law that comes from a different perspective um, an indigenous perspective that is not quite the same. It's related to, but it's not quite the same as the common law and the civil law, and needing to understand that. So as a, as a Pueblo woman in legal academia, I feel like that's what I'm trying to do, is to explain these things that are important to me, um, sort of like at this broader level. I also think that, as I say, that in I think in my writing, um, in both in my work and my representation, there's always this interweave with the personal, which is what are, what have I experienced? What am I coming out of? What is my experience as a mother, as a sister, as a grandmother now? And how does that 
relate to what I'm seeing unfold in the law or what's happening at any given time. And you really can't separate those out. And what I experience in the academy as a woman of color, as a person from New Mexico, you know, from one of the communities that the university is to serve. As a mother, what my children have gone through, um, what I experience as a tribal person, you know, married to a, a, a non-Pueblo person who is tribal. All of these things, they, they come together and they impact us. And that's what I want to write about, you know, where they intersect law. I want to give voice to what it is like to be a woman you know, in the Pueblo. And certainly your writings geared toward the family. Is there anything we haven't asked you that you would like to talk about or say? As I was preparing for this interview, you know, I asked you beforehand, what, what are you going to be asking? And I was just thinking how hard it is to really put your finger on on exactly the way that we live our lives are you know really there's a lot of complexity there's a lot of sim simplicity too right but but there's really a lot of complexity to the most mundane or the most everyday thing about why we do something and not something else and so I was thinking <laughs> I'm not going to be able to say what a day from now or two hours from now, I'm going to say, I didn't say that. And, you know, that's really what I was trying to say, or, you know, that's really important. So I think really that we are, we are simple people, but really there's a complex weave about all of us. And um, to give credit and to give honor to all of those who have um, influence not even not just you know where I am now or what I'm doing now but how I think how I th how I think you know why I say what I say or how I teach like how I teach is immense um, you know down to um, you know something that I experience to you know my, my partially my upbringing you know my parents, what I saw, um, what I see, um, you know, um, what I'm exposed to, um, just, you know, that, that internationality of an indigenous identity, that there are indigenous peoples across the world, and um, we have a commonality among us that is just amazing and surprising you know, that, that really comes from our indigenous knowledge systems, the way that we think as groups, as tribal people, to individuals in my life. You know, the people who helped me at the law school, you know, there was a cohort of, uh, you know, people, people I went to undergraduate school with, people I grew up with, my relatives at Isleta, my father and my mother, my siblings, my children, my grandchildren, my students. I mean, oh my gosh, my students. Really amazing, amazing people. Uh, native and non-native. Our lives are complex and they're really beautiful. You know, like everybody has, has a lot of beauty in their lives. A story that tells about what they're doing now, no matter what they are doing. Thank you for joining us. Like I said, you were the first person on my list um, to that I wanted to invite because I think you have an extraordinary story and you providing a good role model for not just women but for other Native youth. Mm -hmm. um, we all come from somewhere that's not, doesn't give us a silver spoon, right? right? So the more we can get this message out that we look like you, you look like us, let's, you know, let's go from there. So we really appreciate you taking the time for this. Sure. Thank you. And I and thank you for taking the time <laughs> and for inviting me. I really appreciate it and I wish you well on your project.